this morning. Um, not sure whether you are a parent. Um, well, if you ever have been a parent, you would have been refined by fire. <laughs> uh, when the baby comes out, right, into your family, many times you don't have a manual. I mean, any of you have a manual? You know, what to do, what not to do? Right? Um, and then, you know, particularly when they are really young, you, know, you don't get sleep. Yeah. How many young parents here? How many of you get sleep? Right? Uh, sleepless nights, etc. And, you know, and the children grow up a little bit older, and then there are different issues, and uh, wait till they hit their teenage years. <laughs> right? A whole set of new issues and problems. So today we want to talk about our young people, whether you're a parent or not, about our young people, our next generation. Right? We want to talk about them, because God loves them, loves them a lot, more than you or I can love them. We want to try to um, try to uh, um, identify with them, try to see some of the struggles they are going through, so that we can understand them and love them. Um, whether you are, whether you have children or not, it really does take a, a village to raise our children today, and we need your help. Right. Uh, next slide, please. Many of them are in the internet generation, right? On the phone. Um, perhaps if someone were to take a photograph of your uh, di uh, dinner time, maybe some of you are also here on the phone. Right? Uh, and, and many of them actually, when you think of parenting and investing into their life, technology plays a large role, um, both for the good and the bad. Right? Next, next. Uh, there was a, uh, there was a, Survey done uh, called uh, From the Connected Generation, um, done by a few organizations. Uh, they interviewed uh, young people from 100 countries, and they began to wonder what are the 100, uh, uh, what are the young people going through? So they're actually going, th going through um, these things you see here. They are actually looking for answers, whether you, whether you believe it or not. A lot of these young people are really searching, searching for something, searching for something to give them meaning. When they look to their future, they are wondering, uh, you know, what their future would hold. And are we, yes, uh, older people, are we going to come as, alongside them and partner with them to give some of these answers? They are actually connected. If you look at their um, social media accounts, they, have, they might have many, many friends. Yet, they feel that they are alone. Connected, but alone. Many virtual friends, but very few physical friends who they can really trust. Spiritually open. Um, they are really open, spiritually. Are you and I willing to take time to understand them and really meet them where they are and share God's love. Anxious. Very anxious. Not just in Sri Lanka with all, everything that's going on, but all over the world, they're very, very anxious. Leading to suicide. Suicide rates among the young people is very, very high. Particularly post-COVID. Sex, violence, drugs. So many of them are you know, uh, exposed to sex, drugs, and violence. That is the reality of the young people's lives, whether we acknowledge it or not, you parents. I'm, just, I'm talking to you, right? Uh, whether you acknowledge it or not, that is their reality. We are going to look at an old Jewish man. We are going to look at an old Jewish man and the lessons he would bring with regards to parenting. He had a parenting problem, and we are going to look at Luke 15, 11 to 32. A certain man had two sons. This is Jesus uh, telling the story recorded by Luke. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. 
the younger son, the brat, is telling the father the inheritance that is due to him, father. I, I don't care whether you live or die. The inheritance that, that you're going to give me when you die, I want it now. I want that inheritance now. And I just want, want it and uh, I'll go on my own way. So that's his attitude, right? A brat here, right? So the father complied. And not many days after, the young son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and they have wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Uh, later we see what that prodigal living is. He was basically sleep, sleeping around with prostitutes and wasting his funds on all kinds of things. That's we see it later on in the text. In the text. But when he spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Think of where he has fallen. He had money for any, any of his desires. He has lost his money now. And he was living with the pigs. The baby boy, brat baby boy, had spent all his money living with the pigs and wondering what next to do. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Interesting. So he realizes he has sinned against the heavenly father, against God. He realizes here he has sinned against God and his earthly father, and he wants to come back home. He feels rem there's remorse in his heart. He wants to change his ways and come back to the father. He remembers even the servants, even the maids, even the drivers had a better life than him. Let me go be a driver. Let me go be a maid. So that, these are the thoughts in his head. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. Just imagine where he had fallen right now from being a son. He considers himself a servant. We talk about the self-image problem here. And many of our young people would relate to stories like this. And he rose and came to his father, but when he, he was still a great way off. And the father saw him. I don't know what the father was doing all these, I don't know, days, months, years. But it looked like the father was waiting for him. It looked like, I mean, the father saw him coming far away. Um, father seemed patient here, eagerly waiting for something. Father saw him, had great compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. All Jewish men don't run to begin with. That culture, they don't like, you know, they don't they don't do that. It's as if, okay, how can I say this? It's as if maybe perhaps you go meet an old uncle and he's wearing a suit, right? And he sees you coming far, far away and he's going to run, sprint to meet you where you are. That's the picture we see here of this old Jewish man waiting for the son to come home, sees the son far away and runs and hugs him and kisses him. That's the love of the father. Next slide. And the son said to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He did the kissing and the hugging before the confession. The father ran when the son took a few steps towards him. Before the son could open the mouth, he has kissed and hugged and loved him. Take note. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put on and put on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Here comes the son, repentant, wanting to be a servant, even a servant. Better than, you know, being with the pigs. And the father didn't seem like he didn't even hear what the son had to say. Had so much compassion and love bestowed on the son. He called the papa a band. He called the papa a band. He called Kottaroti uncle to come in and start a party. And that's what he did. Just think about it. Here's the wavered son who wished him dead by taking his inheritance, he returns, and there is the big band, the big party, the fatted calf, lamb biryani, whatever food you can think of. He had a feast planned. He was rejoicing at the fact that the wayward son had come back home. Next one, please. Now his older son was in the field. And, on, and as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. The brother wasn't happy, but the brother was angry and would not even go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Next, so he answered and said to the father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat. Not even a pulsam ball and roast barn party. Now the wayward son comes off my... Podian, Podibaba. And you, you have a Koptarodi party with the, with the band coming in. Jealousy, angry, envious, comparis, comparing parenting techniques, favoritism, he feels. And so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you, I never transgressed your command at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, oh my goodness, he doesn't even call him his brother. This son of yours came and has devoured your livelihood with harlots. You killed the fatted calf for him. Do you think it's fair? Do you think it's fair? Okay, I see, I hear some no's. Okay, let's talk about it a little bit later. Next. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead. Dead. And is alive again. Was lost, and is found. Right. I don't know whether you have any wayward children in your life. I don't know whether you have wayward younger brothers, younger sisters, perhaps people you want to influence. In your life, you feel like they're so far away from God. Perhaps people you want to kind of befriend, encourage. The father never gave up. The father was waiting for the prodigal to come home. And when he took 
a step, simple steps towards home, the father ran and bestowed love on him. So when we think of our children, when we think of our young generation, new generation, next generation, now generation, whatever you want to call our young people, are we willing to have a similar heart like the father? So what we see here, we're going to look at a few lessons from this text and apply it to parenting, apply it to influencing young people, encouraging them. And perhaps if you are one of these young people, we want to partner with you to help reach your generation. Words of affirmation. The father spoke words of life, words of love, words of grace, built up the young person, affirmed who he is. He is his son. His son. Next, please. Words have power. Words have lots of power. Words are used like weapons. They can punch you. Words hurt more than physical punches. They can destroy you. They can ruin you. You can have psychological headaches and pains for decades. It takes a long time to bring healing. Proverbs 18.21, the tongue has the power of life and death. What comes out of our mouths? Do we, do we bring out words of life or words of death? When you think of young people, your own children, do you have thoughts of generosity and love and you express that in good, goodness, um, speaking into their lives, into their future? Or do we use words like that? That idiot or that fool, right? Do you say that to your children? I mean, words like negative words like that? Naughty or, you know, you put them down, maybe even worse words? I mean, they are your stewards. They have been given to you for a certain period of time. They are made in the image of God, loved by Him. Jesus died for each of them. They are precious. They are his masterpiece. He loves them very, very much. My friends, I'm also guilty. Many of these things I'm um, presenting this morning. But we all need help. Right? Um, so what comes out of our mouth when you think of young people? Are we building them up? Are we encouraging them? Or, or are we just putting them down and we are proclaiming almost death into their lives? What's in your heart comes out. That's what the Bible says, right? So if all kinds of words come out of our mouth, it's actually an indication of what goes on in our heart. So this morning we can ask God, God, all these words are coming out. God, clean my heart. Clean my heart. Give me the heart you have. Just like even this father who had a, such a heart of generosity and love. Give me that love. Give me that heart for young people. For my own children. Because words have power. Next. Are we willing to proclaim words of healing? Words of comfort? My friends, the, the next generation really needs that. They are looking for friends. They are looking for mentors. They are looking for people who can come alongside them. Helping them with their business choices, career choices, school choices. Now, when, they, when our economy has all kind of issues and we, they don't know what the future holds, now they are looking for answers. Would you consider befriending one of them, two of them, three of them? Sharing your life, perhaps inviting them to your home for a simple meal. I'm sure they will be more than happy with Paul Ball and Rose Pan. Cost you very little. Very little. But it can have an eternal impact. If they don't know Jesus, it can have an eternal impact. 
Are you willing to open up your lives, your homes, and befriend these young people and speak words of healing and words of comfort? There is power in our words. So are we willing to communicate love to them? And not just, yeah, you can even say, you know, saying, I love you. And if you are a father or a mother, how many times do you say, I love you to your children? Why is it that if in this Asian culture, we are, so words like that don't kind of naturally flow out? Yes. Words have power. Let's declare it over our own children. Perhaps we can then declare it over other young people who we are trying to mentor, trying to reach out. We can love them and we can express that love through the love of God. The father hugged him, hugged the prodigal. I'm sure he was hurt when the, the young son had said, you know, father, you know, I want my inheritance. And he's squandered the inheritance. He's squandered the inheritance. But the father had forgiven him. When he saw him running, he had already forgiven him. And he hugged him. Hugged him with love. Naturally, I mean, if you, if, if you know me, I, I don't like to hug people <laughs> to begin with, right? Uh, it's, it doesn't naturally come, right? Um, but you know what the Bible say, states is? You know, to express our love. To express our love. Even sometimes when it's not comfortable, particularly to our children, our, our young people, now, some of them need physical touch, affection, to know that they are loved, that they're cared for. Are we willing to take that extra step? So what we also see in the Father is not just the power of words, but forgiveness and grace. I mean, not only did he forgive the son, he went beyond. He had a party for the son. Not only, you know, he had like, you know, he, he, um, he slaughtered his fatted calf, probably his treasured possession, right? Um, treasured possession was slaughtered for the sake of the son. He expressed forgiveness and grace. Next, please. So in verse 20, it states, when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And later on, the son is expressing, 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So the father, even before the son confessed, or said sorry, right? He had already forgiven and loved the son. It's a picture of God, if you think about it. Who starts our relationship with God? Is it us or is it God? God is the one who initiates. And we respond to his amazing, awesome love. Are we willing to take initiative? Maybe if you have any wayward children, children who have gone far away, are you willing to initiate and show them that they are loved? Perhaps there is someone you're trying to reach out to and they've rejected you. Over and over again. Are you willing to give them second, third, ten chances to show that they are loved? This painting, it's Rembrandt, right? Rembrandt's painting. It's a famous painting. Right? Uh, we are going to zoom in on the hands. It's the return of the prodigal son. Uh, Rembrandt's famous painting where we see the prodigal son come in and the father is embracing the son. You'll notice there are two hands. Each of the hands are different. One looks like a male hand, another looks like the other one looks like a female hand. Signifying, you know, uh, God uh, not only shows the fatherly love, fatherly love of protection and guidance and direction, but also the motherly love of embracing and, you know, nurturing the nature of love. And that's who our God is. You know, our God is, our God's love is all encompassing. Perhaps for some of our children, they may not have one uh, parent's influence. It could be for a variety of different reasons. And when we love them, some of us might have to play the role of both the father 
and the mother. So it's, enc it's an encouragement for you to do that. And for some of you young people, perhaps you will feel like, um, some of you are here, um, maybe you never received this kind of parental love. Maybe you feel like, oh my goodness, you know, the Bible is uh, call, you know, calling us to have this kind of love, but I have never received it. But you know what? You are here today because God loves you. Even if a parent may have not shown you this kind of unconditional, supernatural, amazing love, a heavenly father has demonstrated that. How has he demonstrated that? By giving us Jesus, you individually, you, Jesus has been given to you as a sacrifice to show you how much you are loved. Not just a fattered calf. We are not talking about a fattered calf here. We are talking about the Lamb of God who was slain for you and for me to show us that He loves us so much. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Can angels separate us? Right? Trials separate us? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So when we think of our children, our young people, people we want to influence, are we willing to love them and accept them? And if you are someone who's working with the younger generation, my friends, are we willing to love and accept them as well? Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. I mean, these are great words to encourage us to be patient with our young people, to love them with the love of God. And we actually, we really can't do this, to be honest, if we try with our own strength. And that's when we realize, God, I can't do this. It's not, the, not only at diaper time, where it's you know, three in the morning, I'm going to change the diaper of this kid who has come into my life. It's not just at that point. As they progress, as time changes, faces change, it is really difficult, to be honest with you, to love them the way God wants us to love. So we need Him. We need His grace. God, I can't do it. I don't understand them. God, give me supernatural understanding, supernatural wisdom, supernatural love. I need to be connected to you if I'm going to make an impact in their lives. So finally, We'll talk about creating memories. Um, it's interesting that the father didn't just say, okay, um, okay, fine, son. Uh, you, you have already come home. Okay, let's get on with life. He took it upon himself to make a celebration. A big celebration. So much so, the, the big brother was jealous, so jealous, angry. Do we celebrate our children, not just uh, their achievements, right? just celebrate them for who we are. Do we, do we create memories? The father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put on a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let's eat and be merry. Right? Actually, you don't have to really spend money to do this. Uh, to have uh, quality time, it just takes effort and creativity. I remember where uh, my younger children, my daughter, when she was really young, maybe two or three years old, you know, we had all different people give toys and so on you know, uh, uh, to her. Uh, one of her favorite things was an empty cardboard box. So she would get into the empty cardboard box and just you know, perform or you know, move around, etc. So all it required was to do creative thinking, spending quality time with the child, and thinking outside the box. In this case, in the box. Now for my son, it was ball. 
And he said, ball, ball. And he loved balls, all kinds of balls. You know, when friends you know, visited him, they brought balls from that country. So it just takes a little bit of creativity. You know, once they get older, you know, think of, okay, what are some activities you can do with the child? Perhaps a date night with your child alone, one particular child. Are you willing to take a child and do something, do something fun, do, some, do an encu encouraging thing? You know? um, and then the next child and so on. Are you willing to do that so that they are, you build memories into their lives? Next. And when you do that, you are building a memory bank. Right? So then, we, then perhaps they may not be ready at the moment even to talk about spiritual things. But when they are ready, they would remember many of the positive memories you had with them and they will come back. I mean, that is the why, that is why the Bible talks about you know, when a child is young, to train them up. So even if they wander away, they will come back, right? So what positive memories are you building into your children's lives? And if you think of our young people as well, we want to reach out to, what are some of those positive memories? Augustine of Hippo, the quote, famous quote, you have made us for yourself, O oh Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Right? Uh, St. Augustine, he's a, uh, powerful, well, a very influential uh, Christian leader who's influenced many Christianity in a very, very powerful way. He didn't start his life like this. Um, in fact, uh, that little figure there represents his mother, his mother's prayers. Um, because from, he, had a, he had a last problem, right? to say it mildly. So many women... Uh, many image, children without women and so on. That, that was his beginnings, right? The, the young, young Mr. Augustine, right? Um, debauchery, you can think, to that extent. And he was living in sin. He was like a gone case. You would kind of write him out. And the mother kept praying and praying and praying for him, patiently waiting, expecting God to do something in his life. And later on, he would write in Confessions, the famous class, classic he wrote, this comes from Confessions, his book, that his mother's prayers are what led him to turn. And he talks about a story. He talks about how he and his friends um, went to a neighbor's house and they uh, climbed over the wall and they plucked fruit. Let's call it mango. So they plucked mango fruit. And he, he states, um, he, uh, what, what, what was fascinating is, uh, uh, he found delight not in eating the mango. He found delight in doing something wrong. Just because it was wrong to, you know, go over the wall and pluck the mango and eat it, he delighted in that. Right? And that, he, he, he brought that story as an illustration to show the depravity of his own heart, the intentions, right? even, yeah. So it's just not, just not stealing. And if we're actually honest with our own selves, we also have a mango tree problem in our lives, right? If we are really honest with ourselves, right? That sin problem Augustine had is in our lives as well. And it is many other people's prayers that have brought us back home. Many, many people. Think of all the spiritual fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters who have invested into your life, into my life. There were many people, just like Augustine's mother, who prayed for him, and his life transformed. His life transformed. He became a powerful church leader, and his books are still read today. Hundreds and hundreds of years later. So my friends, you too can pray, right? We can pray. And when we think along these lines, it's just not only um, uh, the, the prodigal son reminds us that our heavenly father also does not give up on us. Even when we stray, 
when we stray away from him and we waste our inheritance, when the Heavenly Father gives us good gifts, gives us time, gives us resources, and we squander them away, we, we kind of waste them away on other things, even when we do that in our own lives, the Heavenly Father does not give up on us. He loves us too much. All we have to do is just start walking back home. When we start walking back home, He's there to run after you, to run after you, to embrace you. And if you really think about it, He's actually already done that at the cross. If you experience His amazing grace, Right? Not only at salvation, but even when you feel like you're far away from him, even when you feel like you have a sanctification problem, you have a sin problem, you have a bondage issue, like different areas you're struggling in, you can bring all that to him. Actually, you have no other choice, to be honest. There's no other solution. He's the only one who can help you right? in all these areas. So this morning, not only do we need to bring our children and our young people, are you willing to bring yourself to him and surrender yourself. And if you really think about it, if you want to be the best parent, not just a parent as a physical parent, but even a spiritual parent, mentoring someone, we really have to be parented by our Heavenly Father. Only when we experience His parenting can we become the parent He wants us to be. Okay? So let us pray. Father, Father, we are so amazed at your awesome love, Lord. Like, Lord, we just can't comprehend how when we think of the prodigal son's story that you just love us so much, Lord. You celebrate us, Lord. Lord, when we come to just a party in heaven, Lord. Lord, some of us are far away from you, Lord. Lord, some of us are carrying all kind of baggage, Lord. Lord, some of us are, to be honest, Lord, we, are, we feel like we are with the pigs. Lord, help us to come home. Help us to come home this morning. And when we come home, we know, Lord, you celebrate, Lord. You celebrate. Help us to leave behind the food with the swines, the bad habits. We want to turn away. We want to change. We want to repent of our sinfulness, Lord. Come and remove it, Lord. We remember Jesus. His sacrifice, the amazing sacrifice, the slain lamb of God that was slain for us, Lord. We remember Jesus. We remember Jesus. As we remember Him, we acknowledge, Lord, how good you are. Your blood covers our sin. Your blood covers our wickedness. Your blood covers our inadequacy in parenting, Lord. Lord, your blood covers our hurts. When we don't receive earthly love from our parents, that Lord, your blood covers that, Lord. Take away the pain. Take it away. We surrender it this morning, Lord. Take away the pain, the hurt, Lord. Refresh us, Holy Spirit. Come, refresh us with your spirit this morning. Lord, we need you. We can't even be a good parent, Lord. We can't take care of the gifts you have given us, Lord. We fall short. We need you, Lord. Come and empower us. Here we are. Hungry to be better parents, Lord. Hungry to be people who would make a difference among the young people. Fill us, Holy Spirit, with specific giftings. Fill us, Lord, to understand them and to love them, Lord. To show them there is a better way. That you, Lord, your way. We pray for our church, Lord. We pray that new young leaders would rise up here, Lord. We pray, Lord. You will raise them, raise them up, Lord. And we, we pray, Lord, that there'll be mentors here, even in this room, who would come alongside them, Lord, to encourage them and strengthen them and to build them up. Spiritually, academically, in their workplace, in their mental health, Lord, there'll be fathers, mothers, brothers and sisters. Raise us up, Lord. 
make us a family, your family that really loves one another, that encourages one another. Lord, change our words. Start with our heart. Start with our heart, Lord, and give us words of wisdom, words of life, words of encouragement. We pray and give all these things in your matchless, precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, I come. bear because some of you are carrying things that you cannot bear this morning they're not necessarily sins but they are burdens that you're carrying and you take them to the Lord and he's going to refresh you and fill you up this morning to the river
Thank you, Dan, for that wonderful message and for the beautiful applications. And we realize how helpless we are without the Lord, is it not? How weak, how broken, how unable to do what God wants us to do. And we need God's intervention in our lives to be the people God wants us to be. Without His help, we cannot. By determination, by grit, you cannot. We need the help of God. I need you, oh, I need you. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the blessed Holy Spirit rest with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.